Okay, thank you. Uh, it gives me great pleasure this morning to introduce um, somebody who all of you seem to know uh, quite nefariously, it seems. Uh, obviously, a great all-rounder would be the best description of Steve. Tragic on many fronts, sporting a part of it, but certainly not alone. Um, he's going to talk about something today, which he always does. Uh, even when somebody else gives a talk here, he often sort of gets up at the end and gives us a, a rather rousing soliloquy. Uh, and we're very grateful to have another today. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Alex. Good morning. Um, so I'm not going to talk about HDL today. Um, what we're going to talk about is familial hypercholesterolemia. And what I want to share with you in the next 40 minutes or so is um, I think how this field's evolved enormously, and it's done it over the course of a couple of decades, but, but, but perhaps the advent of the PCSK9 inhibitors, which finally gives us a therapy that we can treat a lot of these people with, um, has been the opportunity to really bring that into the, um, the spotlight, and, uh, and, and hopefully I can persuade you it's, a, it's an important condition worth treating. Um, this slide summarises my disclosures. Um, here's a tale of two women. I said I'd start with art history, and, and here you go. Um, these two women have familial hypercholesterolemia. On the left uh, is a fairly uh, well-known uh, portrait that you should all be uh, accustomed with. Um, the one on the right is uh, titled The Portrait of an Elderly Lady. That, that woman was 60 when she had her um, painting uh, uh, portrait uh, commissioned, so perhaps uh, um, the definition of elderly in, in 1633 might be a little bit different than what we think elderly is today. Um, but they both have familial hypercholesterolemia, and, and, and how do I know that? Because they have the telltale signs. Um, <coughs> Mona Lisa actually has a tuberous xanthoma here on her right, uh, right hand, um, which is a collection of cholesterol just below the surface of the skin, and just on the inner surface of the left eye you see another uh, cholesterol deposit, and here you see a number of cholesterol deposits uh, that have been captured by the artist. Uh, so, um, artists of the ilk of Da Vinci et al., um, who are quite observant, were able to actually pick up um, those features um, 500 years ago. Um, familial hypercholesterolemia is, is not a rare genetic disorder. In fact, I suspect this data grossly understates the reality. Uh, this is uh, British data it really just looks at the frequency of genetic defects of a range of uh, well-known genetic disorders in the British population um, and the frequency per thousand births, really reflecting that heterozygous FH is not only common, but it's much more common than a whole bunch of other conditions um, that, we certainly, um, that we certainly know that the community are aware of. Um, many of the conditions on that slide are, are not uh, uh, unknown conditions as far as the public's concerned. Um, and our concern is that this is really about exposing uh, individuals not only from conception but actually prior to that, and we might kind of touch on some of those points later on, um, to a lifelong higher level of cholesterol. And ultimately, um, cholesterol and vascular disease becomes a, an area under the curve. So the greater uh, amount of time that your vessel wall is exposed to um, a higher degree of cholesterol, the more likely that is they're going to drive kind of vascular disease. Um, um, we're going to walk through in the next kind of 30 minutes or so the different types of uh, FH. I'm going to talk about the kind of the mild and, and all the way up to the extreme. And as you can see on this slide, clearly the more extreme forms of familial hypercholesterolemia will just ultimately. Uh, expose the artery wall to that much higher level of cholesterol in a much shorter period of time. And we know that there are definitely tragic stories of families who have severe homozygous FH where there are four or five-year-old children who have sudden cardiac deaths. So um, again, it's not necessarily always a case of longevity. The, er the longevity, the area under the curve can have catastrophic consequences uh, at a very early stage if the levels are much higher. Um, I'm going to focus on heterozygous FH. I'm going to talk a lot more about homozygous FH than what we perhaps normally talk about, and I think it has actually taught us a lot about the disease and the genetics, um, and then talk about some of the therapies and, and perhaps some of the challenges for us as a group and at SAMRI uh, towards the end. So here's the basic mantra, is that most heterozygous FH is caused by one of three 
mutations, either involving the LDL receptor, apolipoprotein B gene, or PCSK9, as we've come to understand uh, in the last few years, that fundamentally for most individuals with heterozygous FH results in a uh, functional reduction in LDL receptors, usually in the order of about um, 50 per cent. That's going to result in more circulating LDL particles that, main, that remain in the circulation rather than being taken back up into the liver. Higher levels of LDL cholesterol will translate to more atherosclerotic disease in a range of vascular beds and ultimately uh, earlier adverse cardiovascular outcomes. We see a broad uh, overlap of LDL cholesterol levels across this range. And so we will see an overlap between non-genetic and genetic forms of hypercholesterolemia. We're going to see an overlap between kind of the heterozygotes and the homozygotes, which I'll focus on later on. And you can see that suddenly you go from a situation where, you know, the average patient that, you know, I deal with in my clinic having an LDL cholesterol anywhere between, you know, two and five millimoles per litre, we're now talking about a situation where in these conditions we're talking about people who are north of eight millimoles per litre and, and in many in often situations well into the double figures. That's associated with a range of fairly classic uh, clinical findings. You see these kind of cholesterol deposits which kind of tend to um, accumulate um, around the tendons um, and you know, as you saw the Mona Lisa certainly had one of those. Um, you see this, this ring of cholesterol deposit um, uh, that tends to kind of run around the, um, the periphery of the cornea. In fact, it can be completely circumferential in, in many people, and obviously that's ultimately going to translate to more atherosclerotic disease. Um, it, it's fascinating when people get referred uh, for management of their hypercholesterolemia, and the first thing you want to do is look at the back of the hands in their eyes, how stunned, how, they, how surprised they are that why on earth would you be interested in looking at my eyes? And, uh, uh, if you don't look, you don't see. And in fact, if you look, you find that quite often. And as I'll show you uh, later on, it's actually become part of the, the diagnostic criteria uh, for FH. So it is a genetic disorder. On the right, you see the really the major players that have been identified today. Uh, um, the traditional teaching was that this was a, a genetic disorder that involved the LDL receptor on chromosome 19. Um, we've come to appreciate that um, uh, there are autosomal uh, dominant uh, patterns that involve the APOB gene, the PCSK9 gene, and in fact an uh, autosomal recessive condition involving the LDL receptor uh, adapter protein 1. They seem to be the, the bulk uh, of uh, the gene, the genetic defects that, that lead to this disorder, this disorder. Clearly, you know, it really follows fairly classic Mendelian uh, genetics, so we have heterozygotes and we have homozygotes. Um, here's some sort of sense for what the distribution of those, those different genetic defects look like. This is a, um, a cohort of individuals of autosomal uh, dominant um, hypercholesterolemia in France, um, a little over 1,300 individuals. The bulk of patients are going to um, demonstrate a genetic defect of the gene for the LDL receptor. Um, a very small amounts of APOB and even smaller amount for PCSK9. Perhaps over time we may see that, um, that relative balance um, change. Um, but what the other also important take home message is that, you know, at least in that cohort and, and pretty much reflective of a lot of other cohorts that we see, um, one in five individuals who's clearly got legitimate genetic uh, FH um, doesn't appear to have one of the standard conventional uh, genetic defects. So it tells us that we've come a long way, but we've got a long way to go. And I can't help but think that in addition to the field of genetics, that epigenetics um, may potentially account for some of the rest or some of the rest of the risk. Um, but again, this has been poorly studied. This is the best epigenetics report that you can find in the literature. It involves 98 untreated patients with FH uh, from France. They looked at DNA methylation patterns and were able to identify that there were a range of lipid regulating genes. I don't think this was an exhaustive list by any stretch, um, at which um, DNA methylation levels did appear to associate um, with the levels of HDL cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, and triglyceride levels. And it seemed to be somewhat gender specific. Again, they were small numbers, and I think that it really does suggest that there's a lot more work that can be done in this space, not only in trying to understand what whether epigenetics play a role in somebody becoming F, uh, having FH, but then ultimately how that ultimately translates to them 
having a cardiovascular event. What they did report, and again, this was a, this would have been with relatively small numbers, and so the power was was limited. But they were able to report that uh, DNA methylation levels at at least one um, lipid regulating gene um, did appear to be higher in individuals with FH who had had already clinically evident coronary disease compared to those with FH whose, clinical, whose coronary disease had yet to be, um, become clinically manifest. So again, perhaps suggesting that epigenetics, um, something fundamentally may change at the level of the artery wall circulating cells that regulate cardiovascular risk in relation to that kind of early and um, high exposure uh, to cholesterol levels. So what do we know in terms of underdiagnosis and undertreatment? We do a terrible job of recognising FH. So here are estimates uh, uh, globally from a range of countries um, suggesting what the likely burden of FH is going to be in each of those regions, but that more woefully trying to estimate what percentage of individuals that are likely to have FH in those countries have actually been identified. And uh, we, we can proudly raise our hand to be uh, just like everybody else and doing a terrible job. The likelihood is that this is, um, while this is the most common genetic uh, abnormality in the world uh, in this country, it's certainly a highly preventable form of coronary disease. Um, and we've identified less than 1% of the individuals in Australia who are likely to have it. So as I said at the start, I see one of the major benefits uh, and outcomes of the PCSK9 program is that maybe it will make us at least start to, start to look. And we, you know, we can have a whole different conversation around the health economics of treatment, um, but you know, the first step to prevention uh, is going to be identifying uh, who these people are. Now, what we've also seen is over the course of the last 15 to 20 years is our estimates of what we think the prevalence of FH is has actually changed dramatically. That first slide I showed you suggested that two per 1,000 um, live births were likely to have FH. And in fact, the conventional thinking for many years was that the estimated prevalence was about one in 500. It didn't appear to differ uh, in, uh, around the world. So there doesn't appear to be a particular country where it seems to be more or less uh, prevalent, at least to date. And again, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of looking at cohorts that have not been particularly well investigated. And I'll put a challenge out uh, towards the end. I'm sure you can guess where that's gonna go. Um, but what we've really seen in the last 10 years in particular, as we've been able to do really comprehensive genotyping in really large cohorts, and the Danes have really led the, the, led the whole field in this, is that the likely prevalence has gone, is actually not one in 500, it's one in 200. Um, and here you see on this slide what the potential implications of that are. It really changes the likelihood of FH being uh, involving 13 million individuals around the world to probably involving somewhere in the order of 34 million. And so it um, doesn't necessarily sound like a lot, going from one in 500 to one in 200, but when you kind of uh, express that the other way, that it really, the implications of that are there are another 20 million people in the world with FH that we, 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 really, um, uh, we really have just scratched the, the surface in terms of looking at this. Um, if you look, you find. And uh, here is um, data from uh, three separate registries from Europe looking at patients in coronary care units with myocardial infarction. And actually just looking at the, the, the clinical uh, criteria for FH, not genotyping them, and asking what's the prevalence, um, that, uh, what's the prevalence of seeing FH uh, if you actually just simply look. And the reality is that you know, one in four patients are probably going to have at least possible FH, um, and a small number are going to have probable or definite. But you know the reality is, if you look, you will find, and you know one in four—that's a pretty good pickup. So you know people continue to ask on ward rounds why, what, 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 why have the lipids been done? Um, here's a really good answer why. You know we, we have a look and we tend to have a look again uh, uh, because you know if we look, we're going to find people who are more likely to have FH, even if they don't have FH, if they have an elevated LDL cholesterol level, then phenotypically it's going to be an important target to treat in terms of uh, secondary prevention. So how have we advanced the diagnosis? I, I could have spent the morning talking about the different diagnostic criteria, so I decided to have put one slide up instead. Um, everybody wants to have their own criteria. The Americans have their own criteria. 
Um, the Brits have their own criteria. The Dutch have their own criteria. In fact, the Dutch have investigated this the best. The Dutch have the best systematic approach to screening, <coughs> diagnosis and treatment of FH. The government's invested in it. They've created centres of excellence. They've created models of care. It's really what we want to follow in this country. They have criteria for the diagnosis of FH. If you kind of look at the bottom, you kind of end up with these kind of waffly terms, but in the FH world, the, 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 this is the nomenclature we follow. If you have a definite FH, if you have a total score greater than eight, probable if it's between six and eight, possible if it's between three and five, and you're probably unlikely to have FH if it's less than three. So how do you get there? Well, if we do the, gene if we do the genetics and you have a genetic defect, well, you get it. So that's easy. Um, but we're not tending to send lots of patients' blood samples off for gene testing, and the reality is that we do make most of these diagnoses clinically. And so, as you can see, clearly, the bulk of it really is going to rely on what your LDL cholesterol is. You know, if somebody's got an LDL cholesterol of 4.1, they're not going to have FH, because it's going to be really hard for them to get there, to get up, you know, in, you know, in points, to start adding these things together. Now, I talked a lot earlier on about how we tend to be a little bit uh, pedantic about the way we look at the backs of hands and eyes. Here's the reason why we do that, because you have that little ring around your, your cornea. You, uh, that, uh, you have that little ring around your cornea, you get four points. You have those little tenderous, tenderness lymphoma, you get six points. Suddenly you add that to an LDL cholesterol that's five, bingo, you've got it. Um, clearly we're going to be interested in a clinical history or a family history of either premature atherosclerotic disease, coronary tends to be weighted more than non-coronary. I've never really understood why that's the case, and I'm not really quite sure if I believe that. And maybe to some degree that's because some of this we know that smoking is such an important risk factor driving uh, some of those other complications and <coughs> hypertension. Um, or a family history of first degree relatives who have very, very high LDL cholesterols. Now, it's interesting in the paediatric population, it's an LDL cholesterol above the 95th percentile. When you talk to the paediatricians who manage this, they actually have to take a percentile chart of LDL cholesterol for age to clinic uh, because, you know, obviously they see a range of different ages and they're not going to remember all those numbers. So it's funny, we, you don't think that, you know, it doesn't even occur to you to take a percentile chart of LDL cholesterol <coughs> to an adult cardiology clinic, uh, but that's exactly what they do. Um, so whom to screen, how to find index cases. So, so they're, they're, the Europeans really have led this. It's really been where the bulk of the research has been done. It's been where the models of care have really advanced um, the cause to a much greater degree. And so it really comes as no surprise that, in fact, they've actually got their act together to be able to come up with a consensus kind of statement that kind of looks at this. So the Europeans, and, and we do tend to follow this, um, recommend that children, adults and families should be screened for FH if there's a family member that presents with legitimate FH. Um, if, if you have a total, a total cholesterol in an adult that's greater than eight millimoles per litre, total cholesterol in a child that's greater than or equal to six millimoles per litre, anybody with premature coronary disease, you see any of those clinical manifestations, then you should be screening for FH. And a sudden premature cardiac death, particularly when it's completely unexplained or unaccounted for, th these are the types of things, not unreasonably, that people should be screened for. Um, we know there will be some overlap uh, between the clinical and the genetic uh, manifestations of FH. Um, at the top you see uh, individuals who are going to have very high levels of LDL cholesterol but they won't have a mutation. And I'm going to show you some provocative data that's presented earlier this year that suggests that there will be a lot of those people. The reality is we treat. Because we're going to ultimately, the genes are one thing, we're going to treat the phenotype. So your LDL is high, it doesn't matter if your gene is normal or abnormal, we're going to treat. Family, we're going to monitor the LDL and consider treatment according to what their risk is. At the other end, there are individuals who may have the genetic mutation, but their LDL cholesterol level may not be particularly high. So we're probably just going to monitor them. And we might consider treatment again. We're ultimately going to treat the phenotype. We're going to treat what the level is and what we're going to think the patient's overall risk of having an event is. So, you know, if you have the gene, gene mutation but your LDL cholesterol is 2 and you're young and there's no history of premature coronary disease, then you're kind of lucky. And, uh, and that doesn't mean that your LDL cholesterol level won't go higher later in age, but it's probably, again, somebody who will watch. And, and then you have kind of uh, uh, the people in the middle who, who have high LDL uh, and a mutation. So in that situation, obviously, we're going to treat the patient 
uh, in an ideal world, particularly where cost wasn't an issue, we would do genetic testing. There are some people in Europe who think that we do genetic testing on everybody. Um, and then we're going to certainly look to screen the family, um, whether that's simply just uh, on the clinical basis with LDL plus a physical exam uh, plus or minus um, genetic screening. Now, this was a, a really provocative result that was presented at the ACC earlier this year as a late-breaking clinical trial. It wasn't a clinical trial, but it really makes us think about what, it, what we're going to encounter and, and does it influence what we do. So um, Boston researchers reported um, genetic screening for the three major gen genetic mutations of FH in a little over 26,000 participants who participated in 12 studies. Um, the first thing they did was they looked at the distribution of LDL cholesterol levels and they found that a little under 7% of individuals had an LDL cholesterol that was greater than or equal to 190 milligrams per deciliter. So that's about 5 millimoles per litre. Right? So that's a really high LDL cholesterol and about 7% are going to have that. Um, of that group, less than 2% actually had a genetic mutation. So a lot of people are going to have the phenotype and not have the genetic mutation. Now again, priority number one is going to be to treat them. Um, but that is a reality. You're going to screen a lot of people to find the genetic mutations and that's perhaps concern number one with widespread genetic testing. It's going to cost and you're going to do a lot of genetic tests and you're going to find that a lot of people aren't going to have these abnormalities. Now, when you find them, it certainly assists with screening and risk prediction and those types of things, um, but that's just the reality. Um, if you then looked at individuals with really high levels of LDL cholesterol and just looked at what their risk of having a coronary event was, and you compared it to people whose LDL cholesterols were less than three millimoles per litre and they didn't have a genetic mutation, so people who clearly don't have FH, if you just had the LDL cholesterol level above five all by itself and you didn't have a genetic mutation, well, surprise, surprise, your odds ratio for having a coronary event was six. So you, you're still at a really high risk of having an event, we're going to treat you. But if you not only had at the same level of LDL cholesterol, if you had a genetic mutation, suddenly your risk is 22. So it, it's kind of the balance and it's where the field's kind of stuck at the moment. We're going to have to screen a lot of people to find the genetic mutations. But that evidence really suggests that if you find the genetic mutation on top of it, then that patient is in real strife. And, and you know, from a perspective of compliance and trying to get the rest of the family screened, and that is not easy. It's one thing to tell an individual they've got FH. It's another thing for them to try and go and convince the rest of their family that they need to go and get screened. Suddenly, if you've got that combination, that, that's a really high risk family that, that we'd be concerned greatly about. Um, cascade screening uh, really has become the buzzword in this space. So, as I've said, and I've said a number of times, the point is to be repetitive. Um, at the very least, it's about screening the family to know what their LDL cholesterols are. It really has become critical. And so as we develop models of care, it's got to be models of care that really start to think, how do we think, how do we help that index patient actually get the rest of the family screened? Old school was to tell Alex Brown he needed to go and tell the rest of his family to be screened. Well, that clearly doesn't work. So what model of care can we create um, uh, to be able to facilitate that? Here's the treatment algorithm for heterozygous FH. There's nothing particularly surprising here. You start with a high dose statin, the patient can tolerate it. FH patients actually tend to be quite tolerant of a statin therapy. You don't see anywhere near as much statin intolerance or the whole gamut of symptoms that statin intolerant patients uh, describe, you don't see that anywhere near as much in the FH population. So people are more than happy to be put on high dose of Torva and Receiver and they don't seem to complain that much. Um, add azetamide, um, add all the other old chestnuts that patients don't like to take, bile acid sequestrants, nice, and um, you know, but a lot of these people are going to end up on. Um, a lot of these people are going to end up on combination therapy. Now, I'll, I'll talk more about apheresis in terms of the context later on because I think that's really more of an option for homozygous FH. Here, I think, is a slide which I think is a little idealistic, um, but it also gives you the sense that the current treatments are only going to get us so far. So, you know what, if here's a patient that starts with a 
LDL cholesterol of about 13 millimoles per litre, the patient's got absolute definite FH. Um, if we're able to get that person on to maximally tolerated statin therapy, then we should look to get about a 50% lowering of LDL cholesterol. If we add azetamide on top of that, we'll get another 15 to 20%. If we really, really want to try, and the patient really, really wants to comply and we start using some of the other things, we can probably squeeze a little bit more. So in theory, you could get 55 to 70% lowering of LDL cholesterol. That's really hard to achieve. It's hard to achieve in almost any of the patients we have. If you are able to do it, however, that's great, except that patients come down to an LDL cholesterol of five. So we've reduced that person's risk enormously, but then stacked up against almost all the other patients I see in my clinic who don't have FH, their FH is still unacceptably high. So there's going to be a considerable ongoing residual risk. We know that treating patients has made a difference. If you look at observational data, and this really just compares this is very crude data that just compares outcomes in the Netherlands for individuals followed for more than 10 years uh, who were treated or not treated with a statin. And you can see the introduction of statins made a huge difference. They're fairly well tolerated, they're particularly well tolerated in this, in this population. Their LDL cholesterol levels do come down and that's translated to a much greater survival over a 10 to 15 year period compared to people who are untreated. This is kind of some sense for the targets that we use. We are treating children and we are treating at an earlier age. So, you know, the sense was we were waiting till early adulthood, then we were kind of waiting till mid-teenagers. Um, you know, a lot of people managing uh, patients now are starting particularly with the higher risk phenotypes to treat probably from the age of eight to 10. Now again, it should be tailored and, you know, there will be families where there's no family history of premature coronary disease. And, and maybe there are reasons to think about uh, not initiating treatment early on, particularly in girls. Girls are going to want to, um, uh, you know, we're going to have issues with stopping therapy at some point in time. And so in lower risk families, there may be, um, there may be a desire or interest in maybe holding off initiation of lipid lowering therapy uh, until after um, uh, they've had their children. Um, again, it really has to be tailored and has to be stacked up against uh, the, the, the whole story. But um, here you see kind of some sort of sense. The targets are not dissimilar from what we're really using in clinical practice. Less than 3.5 millimoles per litre in children, less than 2.5 millimoles per litre in adults. And if you have coronary disease or diabetes, there's no reason why we shouldn't be aiming for the same types of targets that we aim in the normal population. Um, what does goal attainment look like in FH patients? Here's data from a large cohort in the Netherlands. 96% of patients on statin treatment. Only 21% of patients get to an LDL cholesterol less than 2.5 millimoles per litre. Um, among those patients who weren't at goal, only one quarter were on the combination of maximum statin dose and azetamide. So, um, and that really just kind of, for those who like to see pretty pictures rather than words, kind of shows you the same uh, shows you the same data. So again, you know, maximal statin therapy plus combination therapy can, in theory, in many of these individuals, have a profound reduction in LDL cholesterol, but as you saw, the majority of patients just simply aren't treated uh, with those combinations. So even with the existing therapies, we need to do a better job uh, in, in, in trying to maximise therapy. Now, what about homozygous FH? We now know that there's a variety of genetic defects that can cause, that can affect LDL receptor function and cause homozygous FH. So the standard treatment essentially was if you had homozygous FH, you didn't have any receptor. And that turns out not to be the case. Now, genetics, kind of 101, that other people are much smarter than I am in terms of being able to lecture us on, on that, um, now tells us that there's a range of different genetic mutations and patterns of mutation. And then, as I'll show you, some of the treatment trials with the PCSK9 inhibitors have actually really supported this. So it turns out that there's a number of combinations of genetic mutations that can result in the clinical phenotype of homozygous FH. You can be a true or simple homozygote, which means that you have two identical mutations on both copies of the LDL receptor gene. You can be a compound heterozygote, which means that you have two different mutations on both copies, again, of the LDL receptor gene. You can be a double heterozygote. You can have two different mutations on two different genes. So you can have one mutation of the LDL receptor and one of ApoB. 
Or finally, you can actually have autosomal recessive hypercholesterolemia. Remember I said that there was that other uh, gene uh, mutation, um, and that involved two mutations in the autosomal recessive LDL receptor adaptive protein gene. So, so the homozygous FH becomes quite a heterogeneous group, and that may, and as I'll show you, it does result in differences in the way the patients respond. And in fact, what it's going to result in is that that whole concept that you don't have in your receptor isn't quite true. In fact, so now there's quite a bit of heterogeneity in terms of homozygous FH. The effect of the different mutations has a variable effect on LDL cholesterol metabolism. So some mutations lead to a total lack of LDL receptor activity. And those individuals have less than 2% activity. We call them receptor negative. That's what the textbooks told us homozygous FH was. However, now we've identified that there are many individuals with homozygous FH who have a severe decrease but not an absence in LDL receptor activity. And so their activity is less than 30%. We call them receptor defective patients. Um, the current treatment of choice has been to try and use conventional therapy, but they don't work very well. And ultimately, a lot of these people, and thankfully homozygotes are rare, the, incidence is probably, the prevalence is probably about one in a million, so there's probably maybe one, maybe two homozygotes in this state. Um, the treatment of choice is our LDL apheresis. It actually has the benefit of not only lowering just LDL cholesterol but lowers LP little a. Many FH patients have high levels of LP little a as well, and it does it safely and effectively. However, it's incredibly time consuming. It involves the patient giving up at least three hours every one to two weeks. It's expensive. You have a rebound of ApoB containing particle synthesis after the apheresis. And it's highly unlikely that you're able to reach LDL cholesterol uh, goals for high-risk patients. And, and by definition, these individuals are all ultimately a high risk. So statins, they can reduce LDL cholesterol to some degree. They can decrease the secretion of apolipoprotein B because they reduce cholesterol biosynthesis. Uh, um, containing lipoproteins uh, in those individuals who really don't have receptor. In those individuals who have some degree of functional LDL receptor, they're probably going to work to some degree by increasing, at least maximising, the liver expression of that. Um, we're going to see a complementary reduction in LDL cholesterol if we add azetamide, the cholesterol absorption inhibitor, to a statin. Um, here you see evidence of that, a trial of individuals with homozygous FH who were treated with either a torvastatin or simvastatin, 40 milligrams per day for four weeks as a lead-in, um, uh, with or without uh, apheresis as background treatment. You can see they were, they were subsequently randomised to 12 weeks of treatment at either the 80 milligram dose of a torva or simva. We don't use a lot of 80 milligrams of simva uh, these days, but it was uh, a treatment option in this study. Ezetimibe 10 milligrams plus the 40 milligrams, or ezetimibe 10 milligrams plus the 80 milligrams. And, and, and here you see um, on this slide that if you were treated essentially with the statin alone, you only get about a 7% lowering of LDL cholesterol. So you get a little bit, but you're not going to get a lot. Um, there's just, even in those with, who are receptor um, defective, um, there's just not enough receptor uh, to, to make much of a difference. You see a much greater reduction in LDL cholesterol if you add azetamide, because that's really going to act by a mechanism that doesn't involve uh, the LDL receptor, it's simply going to uh, reduce cholesterol um, um, absorption. So what's the, been the impact of introducing uh, more modern therapies such as statins and azetamide uh, to patients? So it turns out the two parts of the world that really have uh, a really good concentration of FA, homozygote FH patients are the Netherlands and South Africa. And it's not, it's not coincidence um, that they are the two countries. Um, here, here really is a nice uh, illustration of how conventional lipid lowering therapies made a difference on all cause and cardiovascular mortality in South Africa. So this was a retrospective large cohort of 149 homozygotes uh, and looking at data over a 40 year period. And what they really wanted to do was that they wanted to compare modern day therapy with what we used to do before. So, before 1990, it was diet, it was bile acid sequestrants, it was nicotinic acid, it was fibrates, which we don't really use to lower cholesterol, but can lower cholesterol, and we tend to forget that. Um, and it was Provicol when we could use Provicol. Um, then after 1990, it became a diet and statins, and then after 2000, 
six in South Africa, it was a little bit earlier in some other countries, um, it was a combination of azetamibe and statins. And um, they actually got pretty good use of the combination of statin and azetamibe uh, in South Africa. Um, this looks at what the lipid levels looked like um, uh, in those individuals who were essentially uh, pre and post the use of modern treatment. You can see that there's been fairly significant reductions in LDL cholesterol, total cholesterol uh, over that period of time. If we look at the age of death, however, and the age of having a first cardiovascular event, um, it's really been a dramatic improvement. So the age of death uh, for all-cause mortality has increased from 18 to nearly 33 years. Um, the age of the first non-fatal cardiovascular events increased from 13 to 28 years. These are highly statistically significant. You know, the, the, the only other presentation we ever hear in this room that has any terrible numbers that look anything like this is when we hear about the Aboriginal uh, adverse outcomes. And so, you know, homozygote FH, FH patients um, just have a terrible outcome. Um, this, again, uh, just uh, summarises that in a more pictorial uh, display. You can see that we've really been able to move the curve to the right uh, for survival when we look at the endpoint being death when we look at the endpoint being major adverse cardiovascular events. So the homozygotes are clearly living longer and they're having their, they're having their non-fatal and then subsequently their fatal events at a much greater rate. Statin and azetamide has made a huge difference, but we have an enormous way to go. I mean, the, the outcomes are still really, really terrible. Um, there's hazard ratios. Um, so, so what can we do? Um, and there has been a proliferation of new therapies um, that have been uh, proposed to be uh, a good therapy for FH in, in the last few years. There have been ApoB, antisense drugs, uh, microsomal transfer protein inhibitors, CETP inhibitors, which we talk about a lot here and cause some of us great um, frustration um, for other reasons, but maybe for FH it is a less frustration uh, point. And, um, there's actually some thought that maybe infusing HDL might be actually useful for FH. I'm not going to talk about that today. We can talk about that another day. Um, and then ultimately PCSK9 inhibitors. Uh, here's what um, anti-sense ApoB therapy looks like. So essentially, you, you really reduce the protein expression of apolipoprotein B so you don't form the LDL particle in the liver in the first place. And we see that um, subcutaneous administration of that antisense therapy in homozygous FH patients can, <coughs> as add on, so these patients are already on statin azetamide, can lower LDL cholesterol another 27%. So if you kind of look back to those other slides and think, geez, if you get 7% with a statin and you add azetamide to it and you get 20%, and then you get another 27% by adding on this, suddenly you've got a situation where you might lower somebody's LDL cholesterol close to 50%. That, that's great, that's looking at ApoB levels. Um, LDL cholesterol, uh, similar numbers, LP little a, as I said, tends to be higher in these patients. We do tend to see these new therapies reduce LP little a just as much as they lower L LDL cholesterol. So in theory, that's, that's great. Um, people really don't tolerate mifomersin at all. Um, they almost universally have nasty injection site reactions they get flu-like symptoms. A lot of people in those studies discontinued drug uh, due to um, treatment emergent adverse events. Um, we saw a little bit in terms of liver enzyme elevations. Um, this was an expensive drug. Um, it was only really approved in the US for FH. Um, it never came to Australia and, and, and frankly never will. Um, Lamidipide is a microsomal transfer protein inhibitor. Microsomal transfer protein is an important factor that's involved in packaging the LDL particles. So you have to get a bit of protein, you get a bit of lipid, you mix it all together, and MTP plays an important role. If you can inhibit that, that's a good thing. Here are data um, from open label study of 29 patients with homozygous FH, six of whom discontinue. This is the challenge. You know, experimental therapies, there are gonna be some tolerance issues. Early studies, you're suddenly gonna get down to small numbers. But you see here, again, very profound reductions in um, LDL cholesterol and ApoB, uh, probably in the order of about 40 to 50% um, with administration um, of, of lamidipide. Problem here is that these people develop fatty liver. And in fact, you know, in that small study, they had serial magnetic resonance imaging of their liver 
and they all accumulated fat. So we saw it on, on imaging, we saw their liver enzymes all go up. Um, again, uh, an agent that's not in this country, probably for good reason, limited regulatory approval, expensive drugs, and now given the new wave of therapies that we've got coming are unlikely really to make a major difference. Um, I'll just make a few comments about CTIP inhibitors and I'll try and not mention HDL. Um, they lower LDL, or the potent LDL, the potent CTP inhibitors lower LDL cholesterol 20 to 40 per cent on top of a statin. They're an oral therapy, they're pretty well tolerated, they don't reduce cardiovascular events in large outcomes. We don't know anything about HDL, but um, that may be an alternative approach to treating these people. There has been one study performed in FH, it was in the anisotropy program, it was a study called Realize that looked at the heterozygote patients. What they were able to, you know, obviously not surprisingly, if you give the drug, they raise their HDL cholesterol. Um, it's no different in FH patients compared to non-FH. But really what was quite, um, quite uh, impressive was that it lowered LDL cholesterol 36%. This was on top of a statin and azetamide uh, in this study. So, so CTP inhibitors, while they may not necessarily have a broad future, could potentially be of a lot of use as a new oral therapy that's well tolerated for patients with FH and as cost becomes a big issue, an oral drug's going to be a lot cheaper um, than a monoclonal antibody. That brings me to the PCSK9 inhibitors. We've talked about them before and we will talk about them again. Um, this slide just summarises that there's been a lot of activity with trials in all of the programs looking predominantly at the patients with FH. Um, the Evolocumab program has actually done uh, um, a study called Tesla uh, which looked at the homozygotes um, here you see uh, one of the results um, for one of the heterozygote studies called Rutherford 2. Um, as you can see, these are individuals who are randomised to, um, to either the lower or um, um, uh, the two weekly or the, or the four weekly dose of avulocumab uh, versus placebo uh, in FH patients. I'd really just draw your attention to the fact that um, the overwhelming majority of these patients had definite FH, going back to those previous criteria, as opposed to just, and, and, uh, um, and, and, and a smaller number had probable. Everybody was on a statin. Nearly two thirds of patients were on azetamide. Um, if you look at the LDL cholesterol levels at baseline with those therapies, so everybody's on a statin, two thirds are on azetamide, and their LDL cholesterol at baseline is 151. So it's a little under four millimoles per litre on pretty maximal therapy. Um, and this is what the PCSK9 inhibitor does to their LDL cholesterol levels. It does exactly what it does in non-FH patients. It lowers LDL cholesterol by probably 50 to 60%. Not much of a difference between the two and the four weekly, perhaps in a bit of this, um, the four weekly you get this kind of um, jigsaw kind of uh, pattern that we see in non-FH. But uh, again, it's really presented itself as a very effective way for durable LDL cholesterol lowering on top of what we already have. If you kind of want to look at that in terms of well, how many people get to their LDL cholesterol goal if we add a PCSK9 inhibitor to therapy, and here's what you find. Suddenly with alirocumab in those studies of FH, we were getting in the order of three and four patients who could get nowhere near goal on maximal tolerated therapy can now get to their LDL cholesterol goal according to treatment guidelines. So it becomes a game changer for these patients. I did mention that there was one study um, in homozygous FH. Th th this has really been a, a fascinating result in a lot of ways. So this is a small study of 49 patients. Again, everybody's on a statin. Almost everybody's on azetamide. But here you see, and this is really what kind of threw a lot of people in the field. Um, uh, it, the field really kind of was um, really kind of thrown upside down by the fact that we saw somewhere in the order of a 30% reduction in LDL cholesterol uh, um, with administration of a PCSK9 inhibitor. So a drug that's predominant role is to increase the expression of the LDL receptor, having a 30% lowering of LDL cholesterol in a condition where you're not supposed to have any LDL receptor changes the paradigm. Because clearly there's got to be LDL receptor. I've talked to you about the genetics before and in fact, if you go back, and I've only really kind of highlighted in orange the ones I really want you to look at, here's the treatment difference between the PCSK9 inhibitor and the placebo, according to what kind of receptor genetic pattern you had. 
um, the defective ones versus people who were just negative negative. If you were negative negative, now there was one person, but that person was given a PCSK9 inhibitor and their LDL cholesterol went up. That makes, it's not going to go down, there's no LDL receptor. Um, but the individuals who were defective, and remember I said they, had, they probably were less than 30%, but they probably had some receptor. They had the capacity to lower their LDL cholesterol. If you were defective defective, you lowered it by 47% compared to placebo. And if you were defective negative, it was 25%. So it really does show that there's complex genetics. It does reflect the way the patient will respond to treatment. So here we then ultimately get to what the treatment algorithm now really should be for homozygous. It should be to maximise high intensity statin therapy, to quickly add azetamide because they won't be at goal, to consider the other therapies, but we'll largely move straight past them because people hate taking them. I hate, ta I hate prescribing them. Um, I feel like I get the adverse events just prescribing them. <laughs> Dr. Ma feels that too. Um, but we are quickly going to move to now using PCSK9 inhibitors. And in fact, we're really starting to use them on compassionate grounds even before um, they're available. Um, I'll finish with a couple of comments which I think would be to challenge a number of people in the room. What role can imaging play? If this is about phenotyping patients to try and work out what level of risk you are to make the decisions of when we're going to start treatment, imaging has a great opportunity. And that's going to become a bigger and bigger issue, particularly when we don't know what the age to start children is. What happens if you don't have a great kind of really detailed family history? You know, not everybody walks in knowing what happened to every member of their family in the last four generations. Um, so um, imaging can play an important role and that should be something that we integrate uh, into our research programs. When is the optimal time to start treatment? We simply don't know. There is increasing enthusiasm to start treatment early and it's largely driven by the fact that we know it's a lifelong exposure. We want to start as early as we can and we get freaked out by the fact that there are families where five-year-olds drop dead. And that worries us a lot. Um, ideally, treatment should be personalised and we need to develop the biomarkers and the other factors that will help us make the decisions. As I said, imaging may be one of those. Um, there's an opportunity for us to really evaluate the impact of early treatment, but also legacy effects on cellular mechanisms of disease, the epigenetics and imaging. You know, one, you know, what, what's the potential to give a short burst of treatment during childhood and then to come off treatment for a period of time? Um, does that reset the clock in the artery wall in some sort of way? Nobody's looked. There are great opportunities to do that across the translational spectrum. Clinical trials should ultimately inform practice. And in this field, where a lot of it's been done without trials, we now actually have really organised networks that we can get our act together and we can do those. If we can find the individuals and it goes back to actually looking, um, then we can make a big difference. What are potential issues for our <coughs> colleagues throughout the organisation to potentially think about? Um, if you do a literature search of FH and Aboriginal cohorts, you find four review articles by Gerald Watts talking about how primary care needs to take an important role in looking for FH. And the word of Aboriginal doesn't come up, but they've got it as a keyword and it's linked in. So there's not a single report on what the prevalence is of FH in the Aboriginal community. Um, there's no reason to think it's going to be any less. Um, there's no reason to think it's going to be any more, but nobody's looked. Um, but we should be doing that. Um, we have an opportunity to evaluate the different models of care. Um, there are nutritional interventions, particularly early in life. So we know from looking at aortic ultrasound imaging of neonates um, whose uh, mothers had high cholesterol levels during pregnancy they've got a thicker intermedial layer of their aortic wall essentially you know, as a neonate. Um, are there nutritional interventions during pregnancy that we should be thinking about? Clearly we can't give a statin during pregnancy, but are there, are there other things that we can do that just slow down the development of those really early changes? We haven't done that. Um, we can work with a number of people developing approaches to personalised management. Um, we need to elucidate that gene biology phenotype link. It's complex and I think there's probably a lot more complexity that we don't yet know about. We need better patient aids for education and treatment. Um, I can't even begin to think of what the wellbeing and resilience issues are to be a family who's had a six-year-old have a sudden death 
um, or uh, what it's like to be told at 18 that you have you know, a genetic disorder that may kill you at the age of 33. And um, I think there are considerable wellbeing and resilience issues that I think that we could look at. I think it's a great opportunity for consumer engagement. There are really well organised uh, FH patient advocacy groups in other states. I think they're very well integrated with the system. I think they need to be better integrated with our system. There is a national registry. Gerald Watts and his colleagues in WA um, really have led the, the nation, I think, in trying to develop a model of care. They've now got a national registry up. There is a node at the Royal Adelaide, which is led by Peter Clifton. Um, um, we have FH patients in our clinic, and not one of them's in the registry, so we need to do a better job of that. Um, the ability to get patients into the registry is not just about learning about them, it's having the opportunity uh, to be able to screen it's for the family members. Uh, it's about um, leveraging patients for clinical trials of novel therapies, and it's about creating a registry that's not just for us, but it's uh, for patients as well. So, in conclusion, that is a very long-winded talk. I apologise. Um, but I do think FH is really important, and I thought it was really important to stand up here and not talk about IVUS or HDL, and I think I've done a pretty reasonable job of that. Um, FH is a common genetic disorder, and if that's the one thing you take away, then that's great. Um, our current therapies are often inadequate for achieving LDL cholesterol targets. Um, uh, we have and we need more novel, well-tolerated therapeutic strategies as add-ons to current therapies. It, it really is essential. The new classes of efficacious LDL-lowering agents are currently at advanced stages of development, particularly the PCSK9 inhibitors. I don't know about the CTP inhibitors. I think that would be a tragedy that we would lose a potential other class of agents, which would be really good for these patients, but because they don't work for the broader range, they may just disappear. And that their long-term safety and efficacy, together with tolerability over time, are currently under investigation. And uh, I'll thank you for your attention. Thank you, Steve. Um, questions? I should have just walked straight to Simon now. He asked the first question. Thank you, You're Simon. You're not going to be abusive, eh? No, not at all. No. Um, I'm going to be complimentary. So, uh, thank you um, for educating me about FH. Um, so. Um, it's very interesting from the genetics field. So um, we've done a number of GWAS studies in stroke patients and we get absolutely excited if the odds ratio is greater than two. And um, I guess you've brought home to me how little we do in the stroke field in regards at all to be interested in FH in those patients. So when I was looking through your list of things to do, I guess I wanted to ask you, in Australia, has anyone actually done a genetic study of any nature in Australia looking at the phenotypes of FH patients, um, that is, heart attack, stroke, or peripheral vascular disease? Yeah, so, so I mean, the, the, the best works from WA, um, where they've tried to do it both at a specialist level and, and also in primary care, um, and, and they, you know, they've found what we've seen elsewhere. I mean, they've found that you know, there's a, this is a highly prevalent disorder. Um, its relationship with risk doesn't appear to be um, any different than it is elsewhere, um, and we wouldn't expect it to be. Um, but um, our, our single biggest problem is we don't look. And we certainly, you know, you put FH and stroke in PubMed, and you'll probably come up with about as many papers probably all written by Gerald Watts as well, um, um, as, as if you do Aboriginal NFH. People don't look. Thank you. Steve, uh, your last slide, great talk obviously, your last slide gave us the challenge of linking genotype and biology. And it strikes me that this is a disease in which we have essentially one risk factor with very, very aggressive early disease. And I'm wondering if we know anything <coughs> about plaque biology in these people, particularly given that quite compelling data you showed from the recent study of the odds ratio of 22 versus 6. Is there something else about this condition beyond LDL that we, you know, we can understand? Yeah, we, uh, we simply don't know and I think that that's been the problem is that kind of FH was kind of considered the homozygous one um, and, that, and they just kind of died. We couldn't really do anything, you know, if you're lucky you kind of got apheresis. Um, and, and you still really did really badly. Um, now we've kind of got this sense that, you know, that's just the tip of the iceberg, there's all the heads, and, and that's really where the bulk of the problem is, and that gives a great opportunity to understand. People haven't looked. 
Um, so uh, imaging gives a great opportunity. And I think marrying that with samples, I think the idea of creating, uh, of having a really strong and robust registry within South Australia, and, and, the, and the, the national registry has really been established with the idea that the states will, in a, in a, in, in a fairly federated model actually, um, but not a federated model that I think will be dysfunctional, one that will enable for the states to, to be able to have some autonomy in the types of activities they do in relation to it. So I think what we'd like to do is, is probably have a, a more extensive session in the research opportunities for FH later in the year and invite Peter Clifton, who's really partnering with me in getting the registry up and running in SA, um, but you know, get probably three or four other people from around the country. I mean, you know, not only the adult uh, researchers and clinicians in WA, but, but I think their paediatric guys are really thoughtful in terms of the way that um, they're going about doing this. And I think we can learn a lot. I think that we can then try and roll that out here. Matt? Uh, Steve, with the new Evolocumab uh, patient familiarisation program, I was uh, only last week hit by one of your slides, which is the 8.6 point this, that or whatever, and I was just touched by the fact, I was just reminded of the fact that um, it is so complex and it's perhaps the reason why Australia sits at 1% um, of this. So, so a long-winded question, does it need to become more streamlined or less complex? Do genetic tests need to become more available and cost effective or should we be rolling all of these into uh, a clinic where people are not overwhelmed by this, i.e. specialised lipid clinics? Yeah, so I suspect the answer to everything is yes. Um, so um, um, I've had a sense that, and I think about it, I, I, try, I try to think a lot about wh why, why we're missing the boat in primary care, right? And uh, um, and I think it's partly because those guys are so busy. Um, I think the second they hear genetic, I think they think fancy gene tests, and gene tests are expensive. And I've lost half the people in the room with the last five words I've said, because I'd be joining them. And I think that kind of is what, I think that's the main driver for why we don't look. Um, the second part then becomes, um, uh, should we have a more efficient kind of clinical criteria, and I suspect we ultimately get there, um, but that's actually not too bad. And I think if we, we can present, I had a different slide that presented that one in a much more complicated way. And so that's actually, and what you get with, um, I think with the Avalocumab <coughs> program, uh, um, they actually give you a, a little pad, I think. But the type of thing of having a, an app or something like that. I mean, GPs have lots of apps and widgets and all sorts of things on their screen. It wouldn't be too hard to have that. Um, I think obviously we've still got a lot of work we need to do in the community in terms of the idea of screening for cholesterol, and and you know we have to battle negative uh, and opposing news stories. And Catalyst doesn't help. And there's a really good article in the European Heart Journal that shows how many people come off their statin when the local newspaper publishes a negative article uh, on statin therapy, and it's and it's it's embarrassing um, how many people do so. And uh, um, so I think all of that kind of comes together. I think that um, we need to have high risk clinics because I suspect that this is just one of probably, in my view, four or five things I've really resisted the idea, as you know, to set up a a, a recurrent lipid clinic. And Leo Ma, will remember it well because my concern is that you don't end up with a clinic full of FH, you end up with a clinic of people who've got funny feelings in their head when they take azetamide, and that's, um, that's, uh, that, that, that's a challenge. So, um, but I, I think if we can try and stream on this, so if you kind of think, go back 15 years ago in this state, I would probably argue that the, almost all the FH patients were probably seen by about four or five people being Philip, Ian, Leo, you probably saw a number. George Stranks probably saw a few. Uh, and that was probably about it. And then you had Ian and Philip leave, and those clinics kind of disbanded. And, and I suspect there was a fairly significant scattering. And if we can bring them back together, that would be a good thing. Leo? Great talk, Steve. Uh, your, it's a segue from your, uh, some of your last comments. 
Why do you think the FH people are so tolerant of high dose statins? Yeah. Um, it makes me wonder about why everybody else isn't so tolerant to high dose statins. I, I, I suspect it's the real answer to that question. I, I can't think of anything in particular. Um, you do always wonder that nature's got a funny way with genetic evolution and that you know we have certain things for certain reasons. Uh, malaria has been able to flourish in Africa uh, you know, for a whole range of conservation issues. Um, and um, you know, our FH individuals um, are instinctively more tolerable of, of, of that. They, they could be. I suspect that's probably not the real answer. Um, I won't stand here and tell you that every FH patient I have is fully compliant. Um, and I have families where you know, mums, you know, 40s, and there's two kids who are, you know, 16 to 20, and one of them, one of them will be the good child, and one of them will be the less good child, um, and they all kind of come into the room together, and somebody kind of does a lot of avoiding of eye contact, and and you know, so there there there's still a bit of that, but it's, um, I think they get it. I think that they, you know, that they buy the story pretty quickly. That look, you know. You know, it's a pretty easy story to tell. That look, I, know, I want your cholesterol to be less, your LDL to be about less than two. You know, m almost everybody else in this waiting room has an LDL cholesterol between two and four, and yours is nine. Um, and you know, you know, I think pictures would help a lot. And I think that's again, imaging has the potential to enhance compliance as well. Robin, thanks, Steve. Excellent presentation. I just wanted to ask your thoughts on the role of non-pharmacological approaches and also whole of family approaches like Alex modelled in Alice Springs in one of his studies in rehab. Thanks. Yeah, I, look, I'm really interested in the non-pharmacological approaches, particularly, particularly in light of the fact if, we, if we're really saying, look, this is vascular disease that starts preconception, um, you know what, if we're talking about not treating people until they're 15, um, boy, a lot's happened. A lot's happened in the artery wall, and, and there's the whole literature around there's endothelial dysfunction, um, there's carotid IMT abnormalities, there's you know, there's fatty streaks, you know, we know that there's at the extreme end, there's clearly large ruptured plaques you know, with, with sudden death, um, and, and the thought of kind of letting that go a couple of decades without doing anything um, is a concern, and I think that's why you've seen the guidelines move move the starting line younger and younger with no evidence to support it, mind you. And when the American Association Society of Pedi Pediatricians came out and said everybody should be treated from the age of 12, you kind of were look left looking around, well, why? Why did you pick 12? And, and uh, there's no evidence at all. But I think that it kind of plays into this biology. So I, I suspect that's really the stage of life where these types of interventions, where non-pharmacologic interventions may be May, may, may have a particular benefit, and we haven't looked, and I think there's a great opportunity. Aaron? Thanks, Steve. Just a quick question about one of the early slides that you showed about DNA methylation and epigenetics. Uh, I know it's a little bit less filled. I know DNA methylation is what's normally used for epigenetic uh, studies, but it also is increased in oxidative stress mm -hmm. and vice versa. In both oxidative stress can lead to increased DNA methylation, increased DNA methylation has been linked uh, to increased oxidative stress. And whether you had any comments whether how much, whether anyone studied how much of a role that vicious cycle may play in um, proliferation of sort of uh, progression of the FH. I think you just designed a collaborative study. <laughs> I mean, I mean that's, it's not been done. That's, it's an excellent question. I, look, I suspect it is epigenetics. Um, I mean, you know, we, I mean, Epigenetics is all about exposure, um, and here you're being exposed, genes are being exposed to a really abnormal level of something, so that's absolutely going to play, but um, we'll find your 50 FH patients who have yet to start treatment, Aaron, and we'll collect some blood in a way that you can do those markers, and that's, that, that's, that's, that's why we wanted to present this this morning, was to get people, get people in the room thinking about, about themselves. Sure. in terms of research projects. Thank you. And so just to follow up on that very quickly, and I don't know if there is any data. So is there any evidence that with each generation the FH in one family may get worse? Um, the, because uh, that may yeah. then imply 
increase well, DNA that, methylation? Well, that's a fantastic question. Um, so, um, I don't know the So literature. we don't know. Um, uh, you know, um, we tend to ask about families, you know, we certainly take the view. I mean, I, so I, I, I see 14-year-old girls, and the first question I ask is anybody in the family had a heart attack before the age of 45, 50? Um, and um, we've used it from that perspective. I, I suspect the experience isn't, uh, isn't, isn't that well known. Um, is there a natural selection thing from, from, from early, early death as well? Mona Lisa died at 37. That might have been normal in 1501, but it also might have been premature coronary disease. I could have solved that either way, but you would have pointed out that she probably would have died anyway. But uh, anyway. Uh, look on that note. Um, please join me in thanking Steve and thanks for all your contributions.